ओम वसुदेव सुतम देवम कंस चाणूरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णम वंदे जगद्गुरु आई विश ऑल ऑफ यू ए वेरी हैप्पी दिवाली ए ऑन इनफैक्ट दिस दिवाली आई हैपन टू बी इन रोम वेर ए वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट इवेंट टूक प्लेस जस्ट आउटसाइड ऑफ वैटिकन देर इज द रोमन कलोसियम विच इज ऑब्वियसली नोटोरस नोटोरियस फॉर द अमाउंट ऑफ वॉयलेंस दैट टूक प्लेस सो मेनी किलिंग्स बट just outside that in the presence of the pope all the religious leaders of different religions belong representing different religions signed a appeal for peace in the world so this appeal for peace which is very relevant and not only today even in the days of mahabharata shri krishna tried his best we all know to follow the path of peace sometimes in spite of all human efforts or you may say even divine efforts shri krishna himself tried to uh, have a dialogue with all the parties who are involved so that peace prevails but unfortunately it did not happen and the consequences we all know what happened but in the midst of the battlefield uh he gave a message which if followed to the letter i mean if you see the central theme of the gita we saw in our previous class last month but if we see you will see that the message of harmony that sri krishna is trying to give to the entire world through the medium of arjuna is what is needed today so today we will discuss on the theme which is also a very important subject in india all of you know there are so many systems of thought and they were not always at peace with each other sometimes even battles were fought normally it was restricted to debates and one who could with the force of logic express or maybe try to convince the other that his point of view was the truth he often won and he prevailed but the corals continued in fact there were six systems of philosophy and today we are going to discuss at least three systems which have become very popular there were other systems of philosophy but they were not so prominent uh, they were not so prominent three systems have become became very popular and even survive to this day one of them two of them are connected to each other which is the philosophy of sankhya kapila was the founder kapila muni we all know who he is and the system of yoga which was later on systematized by patanjali so it was known as the yoga system very popularly known as patanjali yoga so sankhya and yoga not to be confused with the sankhya yoga of the gita we'll come to that what sankhya means in the gita but as a system of philosophy the six systems of philosophy three systems of philosophy were uh, since time immemorial were followed in india 
many philosophies based or many religious sects or uh, you may say religious modes of worship were based on the Sankhya philosophy of Kapila and then as a logical consequence the science of yoga I deliberately call it science it is actually Gita every chapter ends with Brahma Vidya which is the philosophy and also uh, a realization Brahma Vidya doesn't just mean some theories which we have to learn it has a theoretical structure but Brahma Vidya actually means realization that we are Brahman or maybe we are part of the Ishwara depending on which school of philosophy one belongs to and the other is Yoga Shastra so Brahma Vidyaya Yoga Shastra every chapter ends with that so that itself shows that it is not only a Brahma Vidya which means the science of the system of Vedanta we come to the third system now of course Vedanta is again divided into three three basic divisions one is Dvaita now all the Semitic religions you can say they belong to the school of Dvaita where there is a creator God there is a Jiva and there is an Ishwara and there is an eternal relationship between the Jiva and the Ishwara and they we cannot say that we are part of that though some of the sects within other Semitic religions and Hinduism believe when we consider God not as a gross existence not just as a gross existence but as someone who is subtle as one who possesses the cosmic mind then we come to the philosophy of Vishishta Dvaita which is also part of Vedanta Vedanta broadly you can divide into three one is the philosophy of Dvaita of Madhvacharya who said that there is an eter eternal God and an eternal soul eternal Jiva and the goal of life or salvation if you want to call it in Semitic terms when Christians and Christians speak of salvation they, it is a relationship eternal relationship with the eternal God God the creator whom they with whom they want to create an eternal relationship so that is why they speak of the kingdom of heaven we also have our own uh, ideas of Swarga or heaven or Vaikuntha if you say Vaishnavas believe in the idea of Vaikuntha where you live eternally with the eternal Krishna that's the idea so there's a lot of similarity between the Semitic religions and the Dvaita philosophy of Vedanta but Vedanta is something more we have the Vishishta Dvaita of Ramanuja which some of the sects or many sects of Hinduism believe in which say that as we go to a higher and subtler levels there is a cosmic mind of which the individual minds are parts so in a we are connected in a we are part of the whole now Sri Ramakrishna used to explain these three different schools and of course when we consider ourselves as the spirit then as the Christians say or even the other Hindu sect say I and my father are one as the Bible says what does it mean at the level of the spirit at the level of pure consciousness there is no difference between the creator and the created nothing remains because we are not gross anymore neither are we parts of the universal mind we transcend even the mind and become one with that universal spirit so these are the three schools of Vedanta which you will find all of these schools the philosophy of Sankhya the philosophy of Yoga Patanjali's Yoga which is a Yoga Shastra and also the three philosophies three basic philosophies of Vedanta which is one more school of Indian philosophy the, they have been reconciled 
in a very nice way by Sri Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. That is why it has a universal appeal. The universal appeal of Bhagavad Gita is because it is acceptable to all the sects. And one of the texts of Hinduism which has been accepted by all schools. You may be a Madhvacharya follower or you may be a Ramanuja follower, follower of Ramanuja philosophy. But in any case, all the three Acharyas and there are several more Acharyas. I am not going into the details of the other schools. Vallabhacharya is there, then there are other uh, Nimbarka Acharya. So they had slightly different philosophies. We have the Chaitanya school. So there are other schools which again believe in the authority of the Bhagavad Gita. So Bhagavad Gita is a spirit, uh, conduces to a spirit of harmony between the different sects within Hinduism as also if you consider it if consider it to be appropriate, if other religions accept this fact, it can include the other religions as well. Of course, they have their own religious dogmatic structure or dogmatic or uh, maybe theological structure, which may not allow them. But Bhagavad Gita is universal enough, which accepts all the incarnations. When Sri Krishna himself said, I come in every age. He never said I come only in India. He can come anywhere. Any incarnation of God who brings the universal ideas of the spirit. He can be born anywhere. There is no geographical restriction. So Sambhavami Yuge Yuge when he says in every Yuga I am born whenever there is a decline of Dharma and Adharma prevails. I come. I manifest myself. So that is what the universal message of Bhagavad Gita says. So if by extension, it's not just a harmony, though today we will restrict ourselves to Sankhya, Yoga and Vedanta, it practically covers all the theological schools all over the world. That is why it appeals to people of other religion, not only the sects within Hinduism. It is so universal. And we all know, historically, if we try to analyze the speech, the song of the Lord. Gita means song. Bhagavad Gita means song of the Lord. It, we all know it was delivered on a battlefield, which again, as I said, we all signed declarations of peace. So peace is nothing new. Peace was sought after or people tried to have peace even in the days of the Mahabharata. They are trying to have it even today. As we see, there is no phase in human history, whether you consider the First World War, Second World War and all the wars that have taken place. Peace is a very rare thing. So that is why we have to sign peace declarations. Of course, they are just attempts made, just as Sri Krishna himself found it difficult to have some kind of peace between cousins. They were not strangers to each other. They were brought up together. They were trained together by the same Guru and they lived together for a long time as cousins. But still peace was so difficult. But Sri Krishna tried his best. Contrary to popular opinion, many people sometimes feel, why did not God prevent this war? Why was this? Why did the war take place? Could God not prevent it? I mean, the incarnation supposed to prevent it. But human mind is such, the more it attaches itself to the gross existence, to the material existence, it greed, selfishness, and all these things, as Mahatma Gandhi famously said, there is enough in this world for man's need. To fulfill his needs, there is enough. We can live peacefully. We can coexist peacefully. But there is not enough for man's greed. If 
even a small population becomes greedy it becomes very difficult there is not enough because they want more and more this greed this uh, selfishness is at the root is the root cause for all the lack of peace that we see in this universe so we will see now how peace was disturbed from the historical point of view this war or this dialogue which took place was just before the war war had not yet begun we all know the situation and approximately if we believe in the uh, uh, analysis made by historians it is 3102 BCE that is before the Christian area era so it was a very old uh, incident or it's a very old event and we all know that attempts for peace were made even in those days as long back as 3000 BC 3102 that is the how they calculate come to approximately and the knowledge of the Vedas the essence of which we can find in the Upanishads which is also known as the Vedanta was taught by Krishna to Arjuna and he taught it in such a way taking into account all the people who were living in the country at that time in that region with all the philosophies so definitely in some root form the philosophy of Vedanta the philosophy of Sankhya the philosophy of yoga these are very old philosophies older than the Bhagavad Gita itself so maybe they existed centuries earlier but because they were not properly understood there was quarrel everybody thought naturally every philosopher or every uh, thought leader of the world thinks that his system of thought is the best whether it is communism or capitalism or any kind of uh, social order we see in the world everybody thinks his way is the best and that will lead to peace and that will lead to prosperity and that is the root of all quarrels of course there are other reasons like in the case of Mahabharata it was greed it was greed that forced the brothers to quarrel to have the position of the kingdom for oneself so we'll find that whatever be the reason we'll find that there was a lack of harmony which resulted in lack of peace no matter how much we try somehow through desire as Bhagwan Buddha said in his Buddhist philosophy which of course is based on uh, the basic ideas of the Vedas and Hinduism Buddha was born as a Hindu so even in that desire or desire for a lower kind of existence the gross existence the greed for that is the root cause of all the problems and Bhagavad Gita shows us the way through a synthetic path different ways in fact not one way that is why there is a harmony of different paths in the Bhagavad Gita which you will see now that these paths are not exclusive they are not paths which are independent of each other they all harmonize in fact Sri Krishna wanted a path which is harmonious and all can follow no matter what their uh, what their gunas are as I told you earlier the famous theory of the three gunas which was proposed by Sankhya and taken up by yoga also Sankhya is a philosophy based on which the philosophy of yoga was established and also Vedanta has no objection especially the dualistic 
forms of Vedanta, they accept the theory of Gunas, that all human beings, that is one of the bedrock of Sankhya philosophy. And Sri Krishna also discusses that, we will come to that, that it is based on the three Gunas of Prakriti. Prakriti is one existence which is the existence that we see around us, nature. Simply put, it is just nature. But Prakriti is made of three gunas, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. And the whole universe is a combination of these three gunas. That is the philosophy which Bhagavad Gita also accepts. So in that way it accepts the Sankhya philosophy because it says, my Maya is made of these three gunas. Very clearly, uh, Sri Krishna says that. My Maya is made of these three gunas. Maya means Prakriti. So he is accepting the Sankhya theory as everybody accepted. Even the Vedas they will find some hints of this philosophy of Sankhya. All of them of course have their origin in the Vedas. Whether we consider the philosophy of Sankhya, philosophy of Yoga, philosophy of the, all the three systems of Vedanta or multiple systems of Vedanta, even other philosophies have some root in the Vedas and broadly speaking depending on the nature of the human mind broadly speaking all spiritual pursuit has been divided into four yogas as we discussed the path of jnana karma yoga that is dhyana yoga and bhakti and according to Sri Krishna himself I will quote a verse now in the Bhagavad Gita all the four paths which represent practically all the paths, religious paths, not only in India but outside India. You will see all these four paths of Jnana, Karma, Yoga that is uh, Raj Yoga or Dhyana Yoga and Bhakti Yoga in some form of the or the other has been followed by different religions of the world. So he says in uh, chapter 13. Verse number 24, he says, Dhyanena Atmani Pashyati, Pashyanti. I mean, Pashyanti is in plural. Some people realize that Atman, which is Brahman, the reality, Dhyanena, the soul, the universal soul, Dhyanena by Dhyana, by meditation, that is by Raj Yoga or by Patanjali's Yoga. Dhyanena Atmani Pashyanti Kechid Atmana Atmana Some of them they don't meditate, they use their faculty of thought, knowledge, the discrimination, the viveka. So there is a path of jnana. First is the path of yoga. Dhyanena Atmani Pashyanti Kechid means some people Atma, Atmanam Atmana They realize the Atma Atma or the spirit, universal spirit, by their own self, by meditating deeply on the self. Anye, Anye means others, those who don't fall into these two categories, Jnana and Yoga, Jnana Yoga. Anye Sankhena Yogena Karma Yogena Chapare. Now others will follow the path of Sankhya or Yoga, Karma or the path of karma yoga which is unique to Bhagavad Gita in fact uh, the great patriot saint of India Bal Ganga the Tilak wrote a beautiful book which uh, he named as Karma Rahasya he wrote a beautiful commentary on the Gita for him like many other commentators they have their own view or interpretation of the Gita he believed that it is a karma rahasya which through the whole Gita, in fact, you can interpret Gita in any way. That is the beauty of the text. Because it is a synthesis of many systems. So, Bal Ganga the Tilak, who was a great Vedic scholar, said, wrote a beautiful comment saying that Gita teaches nothing but Karma Rahasya. So, Karma Yoga was something which he saw was important in Gita. Shankaracharya and others will say, no, he taught Jnana. The whole book speaks of Jnana. Others like Ramanuja and Madhvacharya, they say, no, no, this is a text for bhakti. So all the paths, 
and of course some yogis they'll say they'll use the verses of gita you'll find patanjali's yoga also discussed how dhyana should be done in especially in chapter 6 but all these teachings are beautifully harmonized as different flowers are in a garland they all mixed there is one common thread and Sri Krishna says I am like that thread Mani Gana Iva like so many beads of different colors there is a common thread which passes through I am like that thread which harmonizes all systems of thought all efforts that we are doing in the world whether we follow the path of Jnana, Karma, Dhyana or Bhakti all are capable all can lead to the same goal they will reach the Atman that is the most important verse in chapter 13 verse number 24 so some by meditation behold the self in their own intelligence by the purified heart but these are the conditions others by the path of knowledge and others by karma yoga so all the different paths though they are different depending on the attitude depending on the guna depending on the karma the paths may be different but they lead to the same goal so this is one synthesis which we see of sankhya yoga and patanjali's yoga and also with all the system of vedanta so the various aspirants whatever path they follow we'll find that they all reach that brahmic state brahmi sthiti as he calls in some other words or they become one with brahman brahma bhuta they become one with brahman brahman is the pure consciousness so in the gita as swami vivekananda said in his famous introduction to raj yoga he said that each soul each jiva is potentially divine it is not divine right now but definitely potentially it has the capacity to attain to divinity each soul is potentially divine and the goal is to manifest this divinity by controlling nature nature means prakriti which prakriti should we control is it only external nature no he says both external and internal that is what Bhagavad Gita says through karma yoga perhaps you can control external nature you develop some kind of control over prakriti by doing good actions by preventing bad actions by, by doing dharma by following dharma avoiding a dharma you do karma yoga in a proper way and that leads you to the same goal so by controlling nature external and internal how do you control internal nature you control it by you control it by meditation by dhyana yoga so anyway whichever path by one or more so vivekananda says as sri krishna says in the bhagavad gita also people some people dhyanena atmani pashyanti kechid atmanam atmana anye sankhena yogena karma yogena chapare so this is just a commentary uh, expressed by Swami Vivekananda in English when he says by one or by more or all of these you use partially any one of these four paths basically and be free this is the whole of religion not just Hindu religion this is the whole of religion doctrines dogmas rituals books temples forms these are secondary details now, this is an important path or oh, this is the important point that you have to remember that all paths lead to the same goal and that is eternal message of india eternal message of gita that no matter which path you follow you reach the same goal other details are secondary but if we quarrel all our quarrels are because of the path that we follow the secondary details make us quarrel i say i have to worship god in one way I worship this form of God somebody says I worship this form of God and then we don't agree with each other and that is the source of all quarrel or we attend believe in this philosophy you believe in another philosophy this is my sampradaya that is your sampradaya and then that is how there are quarrel quarrels between 
religious sects within Hinduism as well as outside. And the differences, then many things more are added. Political compulsions, nationalities, race, material wealth. So it's not just, uh, we should not blame religion for all this. When you say adharma, it doesn't mean just religion. Though dharma loosely translated is known as religion. But when Sri Krishna tells of dharma, he is talking of a way of life. So when that way of life can be disturbed if you are greedy, if one tries to accumulate things beyond his needs, if greed overpowers, then it may not, your philosophy may not be same or different, it may be different. But that's not the reason for quarrel. Though people have used religion, all the religious wars are fought, not because we disagree with each other. Very often it is not because of philosophy, but because of the greed based on, because of the needs that multiply because of the greed in the human heart. So Buddha believed that it is the desire, Tanna or Trishna, which, which respond, is responsible for all the corals that we see. Now, we will come to the various aspects of God. This is very important. In the Upanishads, we find only one aspect of God. I mean, if we read the Upanishads, the basic text of Hinduism, you will find not just one, but the main aspect of God which is discussed is the impersonal, impersonal Brahman without Nirakara Nirguna. Why that was done? Because that's the only way you reach the universal spirit. And the moment you say God is not a person, we can have personal gods, but the true reality is impersonal. It is attributeless and formless. Nirakar, that is formless, and nirguna, without any gunas. If he has gunas, then what is the difference between the soul, the jivatma, and the paramatma? Paramatma has to be free from guna. That is why Sri Krishna says, my maya, my, my maya, which is very difficult to transcend. It is so difficult to become three guna atita. Atita means beyond. So, to go beyond the gunas is the goal of yoga, the goal of Sankhya, the goal of yoga and the goal of Vedanta. So, Sri Krishna says that I incarnate myself. When he says that I, he is talking from the standpoint of attributeless, formless God. I incarnate myself in every age. Sambhavami Yuge Yuge. What does it mean? The impersonal, the all-pervading Ishwara takes a human form. With how, how does he take a human form? With the help of his own Maya. What is that Maya? That is Prakriti which with the help of the combination of gunas. So, he willingly, see you have to remember, we are bound by the gunas, whereas the Lord is not bound by the gunas. He assumes as it were. That's why when we come to the philosophy of Shankara, he refrains from saying that God assumes, definitely as it were, he assumes. It's an illusion according to him. According to the Advaita philosophy, God assumes for our purpose a form which is not real, but according to Madhva it is real. It is not only real, it is eternal. There is an eternal God and an eternal soul. And the highest you can as expect is to be eternally connected to that God. That is something similar to the Christian idea of God. We somehow get connected and the whole of sadhana, whole of religious pursuit is just to get connected. So whether you believe in an impersonal God, which Sri Krishna says, and which is the message of the Upanishads, but that same God when he comes down in the human form, the concept of avatara is something 
new that of course comes much later in hinduism maybe it was a reaction as they say to the concept of personal god which we got from semitic religions you see india in if we take the vedic age there was a lot of harmony harmony in the sense the idea of personal god came much later no doubt we worshiped god as sun we worshiped god in nature everywhere but everybody was free he could worship the wind god he worshiped everything around him he worshiped the wind he worshiped the seas he worshiped nature the concept of having god uh, worshiping god as a person many people many scholars believe it was a reaction to many of the religions which came to india semitic religions which always thought swami vivekananda tells a beautiful gives a beautiful example why god should be worshiped as a person why as a human being then he says sup suppose this is just a hypothetical situation suppose he says a buffalo or a cow worships god in it in the mind of the cow or the buffalo suppose when it's a hypothetical situation it will have a form which is a very powerful cow or a very powerful buffalo it will not worship any other species so when we worship human beings we can of course worship hinduism worships all animals also we worship trees we worship animals it's more more liberal than other religions but mainly man is chosen because it's easy for man uh, for human beings to conceive of a reality who is far superior who is not under the control of nature like ordinary jivas so the concept of god who is all powerful if god were like us then that personal god is of no use to us he has to be powerful he has to solve our problems our supplications whatever be our level of prayer some people want god only for helping them in their material pursuits we want god we worship god as the god who will give us wealth god who will give us health in hinduism there are so many gods in other religions there may be one god who solves all our problems why do we need god for most of the people a majority of the people we need god to solve our human problems we don't want to realize the uh, we don't we are not interested in brahma vidya though sri krishna ends every chapter by saying brahma vidyayam yoga shastre sri krishna arjuna samvade that is different yogas all yogas ultimate goal is to give you brahma vidya but many are not perhaps not ready for that or don't want that right now at their stage of life they will discuss brahma vidya we will all discuss brahma vidya but right now i have my own problems and if god can solve that i am happy and sri krishna says that is perfectly all right whatever people want if they send in a supplication i supply those needs yoga kshema vahamyam but not to all we should not feel that we just go to god and pray for anything and he will give us it's not so easy ananya chintayanto ma ye jana paryupasate tesham nitya bhi yuktanam yoga kshemam vahamyam the lord gives us the promise this is prayer you will find in all religions most of the religions a majority of humanity prays to god because it wants to assure it wants an assurance of yoga and kshema so yoga and kshema means to get what you don't have and to preserve what you already have these are the two fears everybody fears only two things one is i have my desires i have my wants it may be money it may be anything else it may be even other things not necessarily material pursuits 
or material wealth. It can be anything. So yoga and kshema means to get what I don't have and to preserve what I already have. So the Lord says I protect the, I take care of the yoga and kshema both, but not for all. It may be easy that I go to the temple, I go to the church, I play every day and he will take care of my yoga kshema, but not necessarily because prayers are not answered. Swami Vivekananda once somebody asked him, why are some prayers answered, why are other prayers not answered? Because Sri Krishna gives a condition. Ananyas chintayantoma ye jana, those people, pari, pari upasate. They not only do sadhana, but they do it in a very specific way. How? Without thinking of anything else. When you pray, you should not be thinking of hundred things. Ananyas chintayantoma means without thinking of anything else. Ye jana pariupasate, tesham, those who worship me without at least some portion of the day, without thinking of anything else in the world, see the kind of bhakti that is required. See, Krishna says, you should not think of anything else when you are worshipping. You know that famous incident which happened in the life of Sri Ramakrishna. He was in a very high spiritual mood. He was doing some kind of, uh, he was singing songs of the Divine Mother in the Kali temple in Dakshineshwar. And Rani Rasmani, who in fact was a very wealthy lady who built that whole temple complex. She was sitting, she was listening. She liked to listen to Sri Ram Krishna's prayers dedicated to the Divine Mother. So she was enjoying it. She was thinking about that prayer and that song, the meaning of the song and, and really in a high spiritual mood. But like all of us, her mind suddenly went to some disputes, some property disputes which she was full, fully worried about or anxious about. And somehow that disturbed Sri Ram Krishna's mind. Though he had great respect for Rani Rasmani, she was such a wealthy lady and no priest would do that. He was just a priest apparently. Though Rani Rasmani knew his divinity, he just went and gave a nice slap. The moment a thought came to her, he just went and gave her a slap. Everybody was shocked. How can you slap the owner of this? huge temple. She was such a wealthy lady. And he also mentioned, even here you are thinking of this, can you not focus on the mother? So somehow he could understand or he could, uh, since he was one with the cosmic mind, he could understand the thought currents of Rani Rasmani. And others got terribly angry, said, how could you hate him? And then they were about to take action. Then she said, no, 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 don't disturb him. He, he was right. When he slapped me just before that, I was thinking of some dispute about the property and other things. So Sri Krishna is giving a condition. Ananyas chinta yantoma, without thinking of anything else. When we go to the temple, when we offer our prayers, are we thinking only of the Lord or our thousand thoughts, we are preoccupied with that and as a ritual we go, we pray and we come away and then we complain that God is not answering our prayers. See Krishna has not promised that. He says without thinking of anything else, if you pray, pari upasate, not just upasate, pari upasate. You do sadhana according to the proper method. Tesham, to those people, nitya abhiyuktanam. See, that's another condition. It's not just your mind should be on the Lord when you are praying. That you during the time of your prayer, you stop thinking of other things. 
and just focus on your prayer that is one condition what is the second condition which is still more difficult tesham those people nitya abhiyukta nitya means eternally connected to me now that feeling of connectedness that feeling a child feels a child never things a small child i mean i am talking of very small children as when it is totally dependent on mother it cannot think of itself separate from the mother it is always connected not only in the womb but once it is born it cannot even live for a few seconds it is so dependent but slowly when it grows up the ego develops then it forgets but before that one is totally nitya abhiyukta means one is intimately connected not just physically but in some way a deep relationship shri krishna is hinting here if that is there nitya abhiyukta there is no no leniency here for those people yoga kshemam vahami vahami means i bear i take the responsibility they don't have to do anything else is this fact confirm if you see if you see the history of spiritual uh, people like tukaram there are so many saints narsi mehta you find in every uh, sect of india there are people who totally depended who practically did nothing there was no attempt made on their part especially narsi mehta i did not even know where should he but he had no capacity to earn money and we find how miraculously lord krishna supplies all his wants in fact he takes a loan his wife scolds him and tells him how will you marry off your daughter you don't have money so he goes to a money lender and some jealous priests they said okay we will give you money but they knew that narsi mehta's power came when he sang a particular raga and prayed to krishna they were very jealous of him they said okay and he they knew he was a very honest man so he said you i will give you loan for your daughter's marriage because his wife was insisting you are useless you are not earning money how can we marry of the daughter so you go and tell ask your uh ask a loan from somebody at least take a loan otherwise how can we marry <clears throat> so he goes he doesn't want to um, borrow money but he was forced to go and they take advantage that oh this person has come now let us uh, uh, have some agreement they said you should not sing this kedar rag that it's uh, he used to sing whenever he had received a boon from shiva we all know narsi mehta's uh, ishta was shiva not krishna uh, in the initial stages and shiva one day uh, gave him a vision and said if whenever you sing in this particular rag there is a rag known as kedar that was a vardan he got that's a boon he got he said if you sing in this rag whenever you sing you will have the vision of krishna and he used to have it very often is to sing in that raga and the priest knew that all his power all his uh, wonderful attainments devotion and all is because of this kedara so this money lender was very shrewd he said okay i will give you money but till you repay the money you should not sing kedar he knew and poor narsimeta could not sing because he was a very truthful man he said i have taken money i have not returned the money so i should not sing and he stopped having visions of sri krishna naturally because that was the boon that was given then one day sri krishna himself came as a rich man and paid off the money he went to the money lender he said please give me that contract which we had signed and allow me to he he disguised himself as narsi mehta himself and paid the money he came in that form narsi mehta was not aware it's a famous saint of gujarat very devoted to sri krishna so he goes there and the lord himself 
because he has promised in the Gita, Yoga Kshemam Vahamyam, I take care of all his needs, though he himself never tried to earn money. This, see Krishna himself in the form of Narsi Mehta goes and pays and takes that contract and gives it back, leaves it with Narsi Mehta. Then he was very happy, he said, who has paid my money? And he was very happy that he could again sing the glory of Sri Krishna in that Rak Kedara and have repeated visions. So he was literally following that uh, uh, following that so he was literally this promise of the Lord has come true. You see, it's not just an empty imagination that in Bhagavad Gita, that shows the path of bhakti also is equally effective. Without any thought, he was preoccupied. All these great saints, if there are so many such incidents in the south, in the life of Tukaram, you will find uh, a lot of saints in Maharashtra or any other part of uh, Purandara Dasa, there is this story of uh, the Sri Krishna temple in Udupi, Kanaka Dasa. So, there are innumerable, not stories, they are real life incidents where the Lord has proved that He comes and Yoga Kshemam Vahamyam, He actually takes the responsibility of both Yoga and Kshema to get what He doesn't have and to preserve what He already has. So this is not just an empty promise, it's a promise made by the Lord who personifies himself as the avatara and continues to give inspiration to his devotees which is the path of bhakti yoga. Bhakti is also a path accepted by devotion to the ideal is what yoga believes in. When yoga also says in the Kriya Yoga, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, though it does not speak of a personal God there directly, there is a lot of dispute whether Kapila, the Sankhya actually doesn't believe in a personal God. But still, the Bhakti school of Vedanta accepts the fact that God can come and can help humanity in human form because it's the same creator who takes the human form and since he is part of the universal mind, whatever un unselfish desires are there in the mind of the Bhakta, they, have, they are somehow, we think it is a miracle, but it is the cosmic mind which reacts and fulfills those prayers. So when Swami Vivekananda was asked in the West, we pray so many times, we go to the temple, we go to churches, we go to mosques and pray for so many things. Only few prayers are answered. Not all the prayers are answered. So why should we have faith in God? That is what most of the modern people, they believe. And of course, it is in a way good because you should not be asking for all these silly things from God. Through your own efforts, you can do all these things. We only have to pray for higher spiritual light, which is the case with these saints. They never asked for these things. Sri Krishna, uh, Narsi Mehta was, he didn't ask for the loan to be repaid. He just wanted spiritual light. He wanted the grace of Sri Krishna. He wanted his darshan. And you see how circumstances change and the Lord himself had to come, personify himself as Narsi Mehta, pay back. And see that his problems were solved. He didn't ask for that. He didn't ask that he just was totally dependent on God. So Yoga Kshema is uh, looked after by the Lord only if he is always thinking of the Lord without Nitya Abhiyukta and always connected to the Lord. So as I said, Avatara aspect is not present in the Upanishads. We don't find much mention of praying to an Avatara. But you see the harmony, wonderful harmony where Sri Krishna, though all the teachings 
are based on the Upanishads, still he says Bhakti to a personal God, His grace in the seventh chapter, there is a verse, 29th verse, which says, Those who strive by resorting to me, they know that I am Brahman also. So he is reconciling those who worship me as a personal God, even they will realize that I am that same Brahman who has taken the form for my sake. And then in 18th chapter, again he says, those who strive by resorting to me, they know that Brahman also, they finally, 18th chapter, 56th verse, they say, finally, uh, at the conclusion, towards the end of the Bhagavad Gita, he says, you follow any path, you worship me as a personal God, even at the end, the Lord gives you the vision of Advaita. So this is something very difficult to understand, because if you see the traditional schools of bhakti, they said we don't care, we just want Vaikuntha, we want to stay with a spirit of eternal companionship with our beloved Krishna. That is also a kind of Sayujya Mukti, Sayujya, uh, that means eternally connected, as Ramanuja would say, I, I am happy if I am eternally connected to my Lord, the Creator. In Western philosophy, uh, we rarely find that, but this kind of eternal connection in the mind, considering oneself, oneself as a part of the Lord, whereas in the Semitic religion, we live in proximity with God, but we are not connected. Whereas Sayujya, which is something very similar to a philosophy of, in the West, by the famous Spanish philosopher whose name was Spinoza, so he believed, of course he was not a religious person, but he was a wonderful philosopher and a very good person. As a person he was wonderful. So he said, while trying to solve the mystery of creation, he said, we are actually part of that God, which many religions perhaps will not believe. Dualistic religions, they will say, how can you say that you are part of God? But we will find in all scriptures there is this, in, especially in Sufi Islam, they say an al haq means I am that reality, I am that Brahman. So we have that stage in the Gita also. Gita is trying a wonderful harmony of paths of bhakti, paths of jnana and they are reconciling. So the personal aspect of the God is the same as the impersonal aspect of the Brahman. We will find it in the 18th chapter, the Lord concludes by saying, you worship me in whichever way you want, whatever suits you, as a God, as a father, as a mother, as a friend, which Arjuna did. For him, Sri Krishna was just a friend, but a very close friend and he turned to his friend for everything. So God can be worshipped in with any relationship the human relationship that we have, it can be converted into a divine relationship through the path of bhakti. So you will find that same personal God will take you to the level of impersonal God. So in the 18th chapter, he, uh, 56th verse, the Lord says, being free from delusion, being free from ignorance, he who knows me, the God, as personal. I mean, suppose somebody worships the God as a personal God and knows fully that that personal God is what he wants. But he know, knows him as the Supreme Purusha, the Supreme Person, who is immutable and beyond all the limitations of Maya. That Purushottama, Supreme Person, Purusha, Uttama, Purushottama, in the 15th chapter that is described. So that Purushottama, one, one who is the ultimate person, he knows that who is beyond, immutable, who, who is not liable to change. As God the personal, he changes. He is a friend, he is a father, he is a mother, different relationship we can have. He comes to our help when we want. But as Purushottama, 
He is the Supreme Purusha which is immutable, which is beyond Maya. The difference between Jiva and Shiva, Sri Ramakrishna used to tell in the gospel through his beautiful words, colloquial words. Jiva is one which is bound by Maya, Maya Baddha, Baddha means bound. And what is Shiva? The difference between Jiva, Jiva is bound by Maya, whereas Shiva is free from Maya. In both the cases, Maya is there. They have to assume that form. But he is not bound by Maya. He is the Maya Dhisha. That's why Ishwara is known as the Maya Dhisha, one who can control Maya. He is not bound by Maya like the Jiva is. So that's the only difference between Jiva and Shiva. So when we do worship in the spirit of Karma Yoga, it is in, in Bengali, Sri Ramakrishna says, Shiva Gyane Jiva Seva. So you don't worship, we worship that God who by the ignorant is known as man. That gives a huge dimension to Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga done for the, uh, as a worship, as a seva of the uh, personal God whom we worship. Suppose somebody is worshipping Shiva, he tries to see his, uh, sh see that Shiva in the Jiva. So we have these saints, they begin with a personal God. If you see the history of all the Bhakti saints, including Narse Mehta, then Tukaram, they start with the prayer that, Oh God, you are separate, you please help me, you please help me in my devotion. But later on, they find that they, as they are coming closer and closer, they become more and more intimate with the Lord. Their whole idea changes. So, this kind of adoration of God in a personal form, ultimately according to the Gita, leads to the highest idea of Vedanta becoming one with God. First, you there is a beautiful story or beautiful incident which Sri Ramakrishna used to quote. Somebody asked Hanuman Ji, who is supposed to be a Bhakta Shrestha and for him Rama was everything. For him even Krishna when uh, any other form was not acceptable, only one form. That is why we have in the uh, uh, Ram, uh, the, uh, the Ram Nam Sankirtan we do, Sri Nate Tulsi Das has composed a beautiful verse. Sri Nate Janaki Nate Abheda Paramatmani Tathapi Mama Sarvasya Rama Kamala Lochana. That's a beautiful verse which Tulsi Das, who is the famous composer, in the introduction he says, O oh Lord, Sri Nath means people who worship. Lord Krishna call him Sri Nath. Sri Nath, Nath means father. So Sri Nath is Sri Nath Ji, we call uh, Vishnu, one of the aspects of Vishnu which is worshipped in uh, India, is known as Sri Nath. Sri Nath Ji. So Sri Nath, Janaki Nath. Janaki Nath is everybody knows. Nath means the Lord actually, not just father, but Janaki Nath is Rama. Janaki is Sita, obviously. So, one who is the Lord of Sita is known as Janaki Nath. So, Tulsi Das begins his uh, beautiful composition on Rama by saying, and he, he assumes that this is how Hanuman looked upon Rama. He knew Sri Natha and Janaki Nath, that is, Krishna and Rama are the same. Of course, Krishna uh, uh, came much later, but both are same. Abheda Paramatmani means in the Lord, as the Supreme Lord, they are same. As Brahman, they are one. Tathapi, but still, as a devotee, Mama Sarvasva, my everything is Rama Kamala Lochana. I know Sri Krishna and Rama and all the incarnations, they have the same origin or they are part, they are representation, the personification of the same Brahman, Abheda, they are not.
not different i know 100% i know there's no difference between these gods but for me and that is acceptable according to gita you worship your god but at the same time know them to be non different from other gods tathapi mama sarvasva my everything is rama who is having a lotus eyes kamala lochana that is how tulsi das says every devotee has to have this attitude so hanuman was once asked sri ram krishna mentions this in the gospel of sri ram krishna he says once hanuman was asked what is your relationship with rama everybody thinks he was uh, he had dasya bhav a, a, he was a servant of rama anything rama did he was ready to uh, do anything for him then he said when i think of myself now you see this is a wonderful philosophy which we will find in the bhagavad gita the reconciliation between the personal aspect and the impersonal aspect so hanuman the great devotee finally he gives this conclusion when he was asked how is your what is your relationship with rama he says yes when i am having the feeling that i am the body when i am the body ram is rama is my master and i am his servant so that distinction is there we are eternally separate i always want to serve him but when i think of myself as a sukshma sharira in a sukshma way when i think of myself as the mind then i am part rama is the cosmic mind i am part of that so that is vishishta dvaita in the first it is dvaita as a body as a person and as rama the person i am a servant of rama but when i consider myself as the mind then i am a part and he is the whole i am part of the whole mind or the whole sukshma uh, the sukshma existence the cosmic creator i am part of that cosmic creator part and parcel maybe i am a small part but i am part of the whole but when i consider myself as the spirit he says something very remarkable sri ram krishna says when hanuman thought himself not as the body not as the mind but as the pure spirit then he said that i and rama are one so you'll find this echo of this not only in the bhagavad gita again and again in every chapter you'll find this starts with a personal whether it is bhakti yoga or whether it is raj yoga where you meditate on an objective god a god as an object finally it leads to the objectless unification the advaita so advaita is the highest goal not only for this scripture but for all scriptures of the world swami vivekananda once said people may not accept it because if you say i am the body then i will be eternally a servant of the lord or a child of the lord and i would always i i would be happy by maintaining that kind of relationship as long as he fulfills my desire or whatever little needs i have then that relationship is enough but that is the beginning of religion but when a person goes further in his sadhana like all these great saints of hinduism or also of other religions they have that feeling as jesus said i and my father are one similarly hanuman says i become one with rama not as a person which can never be as a person when i think of myself as a body i am eternally separate when i think of myself as the mind i am a level higher i become part of the lord and when i think of myself as the pure spirit then i don't see any difference i and rama are one i and my father in heaven they become one one in spirit but unfortunately people do not understand that is why there are corals corals will be at the physical level or even at the mental level but not in, at the level of spirit 
That's why they say, well, if you have that Advaitic realization, then you see upon everything. Like Gavi Hastini in, in the, one of the chapters, he says, whether it is a cow or an elephant, everybody looks alike. Everybody is the same. It doesn't make any difference what form they, because at that stage, you become one with the universal consciousness, then you reach that state of Advaita. So the personal aspect falls only when you transcend the body and the mind at the lower two levels. So that is the greatest harmony of the systems of yoga. Even yoga accepts that. He said Prakriti has its hold on us, though they accept two realities. That is why they say the system of yoga is dualistic. They believe in two realities, Purusha and Prakriti, which are eternally separate. Whereas in Advaita, the difference is, that's why they don't accept the school of yoga. The Advaita school of Vedanta say it's that Prakriti, it is not a reality, it is just an illusion. Purusha alone is, Purusha or Brahman alone is real. That's a slight difference, otherwise it is the same. But we see all the different verses. Uh, Nadji has beautifully written three volumes. If you read those volumes, it is trying to express the idea that thou art that. That is the idea. Thou art that Tattvamasi, which is expressed in the Gita. They say, roughly if you see, though you cannot completely say that the first six chapters, the next six and then 18 chapters. The first six chapters, the meaning of Tao, Tat, Tvam, Tvam, Tvam is there. The indwelling self is described. It is the birthless and deathless reality. Next, next six chapters describe the meaning of that. The Supreme Lord, the Purushottama or Purushottama, Purushot, Lord as Purushottama, the Supreme Self. First is the indwelling self, then is the Supreme Self. And the last six chapters is concerned with determining the meaning of the sentence, Thou art that as a whole. So, in the 13th chapter, know the self, Supreme Self to be the Purusha, the knower of the field, Kshetragna and Kshetra. <clears throat> so that is how Bhagavad Gita brings about a wonderful synthesis that the different aspects of reality. In his own simple way, Sri Ramakrishna used to say, somebody asked him, what is the essence of religion? So he said, the essence of religion is very simple. Know who you are and referring to himself, he said, know who I am, that is who the Lord is, your Ishta is, and what is the relationship between us, Tat Tvamasi, that is the goal of all religious pursuits. You first think of Lord as the separate, Lord as separate and then yourself as separate, but try to know who you are. What is that nature of that Jivatma? What are the limitations? What are the capacities? What are the potentials? And try to analyze with the help of scriptures, with the help of Upanishads, with the help of Vedanta and all the available ideas. Try to get a conception of the Purushottama, who he is. What is the difference between Jiva and that Purushottama? And then what is our relationship? This is the whole science of the self or the science of spirituality. Religion deals only with these things, whether you take the Upanishads, whether you take the Bhagavad Gita, especially in the Bhagavad Gita, as Swami Vivekananda said, it's a wonderful synthesis. That's why some of them interpret this, the first chapter, the next six chapters, and the last chapter, establishing a relationship. That is one way of doing it. So, Bhagavad Gita as Gyan Yoga as pure Vedanta, school of Vedanta. In the second chapter, 11th verse itself, Sri Krishna begins by giving the highest wisdom. It may look strange that he is not proceeding from bhakti to higher levels. He starts with Jnana and then 
goes down then again uh, uh, concludes in the 18th chapter with a harmony of all the yogas. So he says in the second chapter 11th verse itself because Arjuna is horrified by the idea that he will be killing so many people, many people from his side also will be killed. So he was grieving what will happen, what will happen to their family. He says you grieve for those who should not be grieved for because you are looking at them as physical things. No, in reality you are that supreme Brahman. So the jnana is given first. The learned, learned not in the sense of a scholarship or something. Learned means those who have spiritual wisdom, they grieve neither for the departed nor for the uh, living or non-living. They don't grieve because they are the pure consciousness which never which is always there. So this is second chapter. And in the next verse itself, he says, there was never a time when I was not. It is in the sense of the spirit. As spirit, we are eternal. That's why in the Bible it is said, worship God as spirit and in spirit. So that spirit or that pure consciousness, which Jesus spoke of, and he talked of the kingdom of spirit. Unfortunately, the Jews and the Roman Emperor uh, who, who did not understand because politics was the only thing they understood. They persecuted Jesus and his followers only because they thought he was talking of a kingdom. Unfortunately for them, kingdom means the Roman Empire. So they were, they thought he's such a popular person. And he is talking of the king and when he was asked, are you the king? Yes, he was the kingdom of the, his was the kingdom of the spirit. That is the kingdom of God. And he said, yes, I have come to establish that. So they thought, because of lack of understanding, that he is trying to gather the people. And that's why you see what happened. They crucified him. But he didn't care. Because they crucified the body, not the mind, nor uh, not the spirit. It's the spirit, he, is, he was still the king and he is still the kingdom of, he was one, he was the king of that kingdom. So that's what he says, Lord Krishna says, you do not know, but I know, I have always existed as the supreme Brahman. So have you, only thing you do not know, you think you will die or he will die or she will die. But that's a ignorance. You have always existed. The kingdom of God which is within you will always exist. Only you have to realize it. And we shall exist even after the death of the body. So this is the pure Jnana Yoga which is spoken of. And then we'll see how it is reconciled with the Bhakti Yoga in our next classes. So in all the three times, past, present and future, we will exist. We are eternal as our nature as the self and that is why he said you should not grieve. So that is why he gives the famous example Vasansi Jirnani. Just as old clothes, when they become old you reject them, you throw them and put on new clothes. You don't grieve for the clothes that have been torn. Every cloth has to be replaced someday or the other. As boyhood, youth and old age are properties of this body. Similar is the acquisition of a new body. So you will take up new bodies. That's the idea of karma and rebirth which is inherent in Indian philosophy. So nicely harmonized. And that is why he says that in the Sankhya Yoga where the best ideas of Sankhya and Yoga are combined. He says an intelligent person, a person who has the spiritual wisdom does not grieve. Second chapter. 11, 12 and 13 speaks of this Jnana Yoga. Now in the 14th verse of the second chapter, he says if we are the pure spirit, then why do we feel? Why do this world exist for us? So he says, because we have the sense organs, contact with the sense organs, with the objects outside, they produce cold and heat. They produce all dualities, happiness and sorrow. That is why we suffer. And, but 
for some people that is why i say samatvam yoga uchyate he talks of the system of yoga where yoga what is yoga most of the people start practicing yoga or think yoga is something which gives them a healthy life what is health health is something which enables you to keep some kind of equanimity physically mentally you don't get disturbed by cold weather by hot weather you somehow maintain some kind of equanimity in life and that gives rise to some kind of bliss joy that is why at a physical level yoga is done so that you have a healthy body otherwise you keep falling sick you fall in, you get sorrow because of some illness so at a, on a physical level yoga the asana pranayama and all those things they enable you to give you healthy body but yoga is something beyond that to have we have to go beyond the dualities of nature so here you will find a wonderful combination of sankhya and yoga yoga's patanjali is more scientific he says you have to pass through these different stages so he says equanimity is yoga equanimity is not acquired in one day after long practice of yoga when you say body is healthy that means it can withstand sorrow it can withstand cold and heat happiness and sorrow but at the same time sankhya tells them that being a product of gunas the three gunas and this temporary solution is good but eternally you have to be fit for immortality so how do you do it you bear this dualities the only way to realize the goal of life is to bear these dualities and go beyond them so going beyond the dualities considering both happiness uh, and sorrow heat and cold these are the few dualities which uh, sri krishna discusses and to go beyond them is the goal of life the goal of sankhya yoga that is in the 15th chapter then he says in the 16th uh, uh, not 15th 15th verse in the 16th verse he says the unreal he goes to the level of advaita you see the unreal has no existence at all this hot and cold pleasure and sorrow these, these are just because you have come in contact the sense organs as a a uh, result of this combination sansparsha when you are in close contact the sense organs are in close contact with the sense objects you will suffer these things ups and downs will be observed in your life but really speaking they along with their causes do not really exist they are not eternal because it changes anything that does change changes is not permanent that is why they have invented a word titiksha titiksha is a beautiful word which is unique in uh, indian spirituality sahanam sarva dukkhanam apratikara purvakam chinta vilapa rahitam sam titiksha nigadyate tam titiksha nigadyate so sahanam sarva dukkhanam so that is the sadhana which is taught in this sankhya yoga or gyani yoga and according to shankaracharya titiksha is the only way so it is difficult to understand this concept of titiksha sahanam sarva dukkhanam so misery is part and parcel of our life but the lord says you have to be infinitely patient you have to sahanam you have to endure or bear all these things how not just physically bear all the pain and just keep quiet not like that your mind should not that equanimity of the mind should not be lost that means you have to reach a yogic state where you are not unnecessarily disturbed by all the dukkha misery and sorrow a pratikara you don't have to react to everything the reactive portion of the mind should be controlled a pratikara purvakam chinta vilapa rahitam it's not enough if you just don't react many people don't react but in their mind there is canker they keep on <clears throat> thinking oh i have injustice has been done they may not speak it 
but they go on repenting in their mind. That gives lot of anxiety and worry. Chinta and Vilapa. Chinta means current worry, present worry. And Vilapa means thinking of that anxiety which follows worry. So we'll in, uh, conclude now. The time is over. It's almost 8 o'clock. So, accident. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Sri Ramakrishna Arpanamastu